before we introduce our speaker. Uh, number one, final projects are due on Thursday. No surprises, I hope. Uh, if it's digital, you can email it to either me or Dr. Hunter. If it's physical, bring it in, and we'll, uh, we'll divide them up and bring them back to our offices. Hang on a sec. Um, uh, number two, uh, e-cafe evaluations are available starting today until the last day of instruction. They're used for various things, to evaluate us as instructors, to evaluate the course, to make improvements so that you know, if you love the discussion section, if you hated the discussion section, here's your opportunity to say something. Sort of useful. Um, a lot of times, if, given it, if it's left up to your guys' devices, the people who love it and the people who hate it are the ones that will fill out the evaluation. So the, the responses tend to be very bimodal. So I'm going to coerce you all to do this. So this is the way it's going to work. Uh, we don't get to see who responds. We don't. It's all anonymous, right? All we get to see is how many people responded. So we'll make you a deal, which is that if 80% of this class responds to that eCafe evaluation, fills it out, it takes 30 seconds, um, everybody in the class gets five extra credit points. Okay? But only if 80%. Only if 80%. So, so look to your left, look to your right, Ask, ask your buddies if they've filled it out. I'll give you updates for me 80% to fill it out. Everybody gets 5%. What does it do? Huh? What does it do? I think it's due like is it? I think it's due the last day of instruction. Or maybe slightly before. I'll look that up and let you know. Should we should right. just have a five minute class session just to do it? And yeah, we should, but not everybody has computers, right? <laughs> hey, we got the okay. phone. Thanks, everybody. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Charles Chip Fletcher is Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor of Geology and Geophysics in SOAS School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology. He teaches graduate and undergraduate courses emphasizing uh, earth science, climate change, and on Pacific Islands and coastal geology. He has over 100 scientific publications and has uh, published three books in the last five years. Uh, the last of which is climate change, what the science tells us, and that's what he's going to be talking to us about today. Help me welcome Dr. Chip Fletcher. Thank you. Test, test, test. Oh, good. Okay. Hi. Right, thanks, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in. We're going to talk about the climate emergency. Um, this is a video of Earth's surface temperatures over the last 130 years or so, beginning in 1880. Uh, this ends in the year 2015. And there are a couple of patterns here that I want you to take note of. One is that no single place continuously gets warmer year after year. Um, the planet itself does not continuously get warmer year after year. But there is a long-term trend of warming that occurs. So this is called climate variability. Climate is uh, from one year to the next and from one place to the next, cooling or warming. And uh, processes such as El Nino, La Nina, um, a process known as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is, as the name suggests, decadal in scale, climate that, that is quasi-consistent for a decade or more and then changes into a, a different sort of consistency. These are constantly making climate uh, highly variable and therefore very difficult to study and therefore very difficult to model. Things like volcanic eruptions, strong El Ninos, weak El Ninos, El Ninos that, that don't fully mature, known as El Nino Modicae, uh, sort of mid-Pacific El Ninos rather than eastern Pacific El Ninos. Um, these all uh, strongly influence whether one year will be warmer uh, than a previous year. However, despite all this, the long-term trend shows us that what we're seeing has no precedent. 2014 was the hottest year on record, and 2015 smashed that by 20%. January of this year was the most anomalously warm month ever until February, which is now the record setter. And we now know that March is the warmest March ever on record. In fact, March is the eighth continuous month in a row to smash all previous monthly records for that particular month. 15 of the top 16 warmest years have occurred <coughs> since uh, the year 2000. And carbon dioxide levels last year 
uh, grew more than uh, any time in the past 56 years. Last year, CO2 levels grew over three parts per million, which has never been seen before. What's interesting is that in 2014 and 2015, humans emitted the least amount of greenhouse gases that we ever have, and yet the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere was a record-setting high. This is because El Nino has been warming the Pacific Ocean, and warmer water holds less dissolved gas. So CO2 has been streaming out of the oceans uh, in 2014 and 2015. It'll be interesting to see, now that the El Nino is coming to a close, what 2016 and 2017 have to hold. Will the CO2 build up in the atmosphere start to level out it, uh, so that it's consistent with the decrease in greenhouse gas emissions that humans have managed to achieve? Here is the monthly record of temperatures since 1880. There's 2015. There's January. Look at February. February was crazy. Compare that spike to other spikes back in the record. It was amazingly hot this past February. And March is slightly lower, so we're starting to come back down again. And we think that February and March are associated with the uh, very strong El Nino that we have right now. But we've had plenty of strong El Ninos in the past. The one reason this, this particular El Nino is so um, particularly strong is because it's riding on the back of this long-term trend uh, of increasing global temperatures. All right, so what I'd like to talk about today is the impact, the effects of uh, climate change. I want to talk about heat waves, changing precipitation, food impacts, rain in Hawaii, ecosystem threats, changing storminess, give you a little bit of optimism about climate change, and then quickly throw a bucket of cold water on that, and then finish up with a uh, discussion of sea level rise. So I have a lot to cover. I'm going to move through this uh, as quickly as I can. Heat waves. These are the most fatal, lethal type of climate impact. Heat waves occur in urban areas where everybody runs their air conditioner all night long. This can cause a blackout. It brings down the grid, and there's no electricity available to run elevators in tall buildings. There's no uh, air conditioning in apartments, so that the elderly, the weak, and the ill, and the very young who are incapable of walking up and down 15, 20 flights of stairs, 30 flights of stairs, end up trapped in their apartments, which become hot boxes. And within about 24 hours, most apartments in buildings that do not have air conditioning um, become very dangerous locations. You place a phone call, but the fire, the police, the ambulance, they're already getting tens of thousands of similar phone calls. And if you get through, they'll tell you, yes, we'll be there, but it'll be about six days before we make it to where you are. And these people are too weak to walk down the stairs. And this leads, within 48 hours, you start seeing waves of fatalities. 72 hours, uh, typically, the deaths peak. In 2003, we had 75,000 people die in a heat wave in Europe. In 2010, 55,000 people died in Russia from a heat wave. Last year, we had 2,400 people die in India in a heat wave. And the reason these heat waves are occurring is because the jet stream is slowing down and developing these big meanders. And in the underside, the south side of a meander, tropical air flows up, and that wedge of tropical air slowly moves across a continent so that you're exposed to weeks and weeks of sweltering tropical temperature in places like Minnesota, Scandinavia, places that are just not used to um, tropical types of temperatures. And right behind that, there'll be another, uh, another uh, meander in the jet stream. If the first one happens in June, the next one comes along at the end of July and lasts through August. And then you can start to get them in September and October as well. And these just beat at the resiliency of communities located in the temperate regions uh, up in the mid-latitudes. They are not prepared for this sustained type of heat. The electrical grid comes down, etc. 
Nine of the ten deadliest heat waves have occurred uh, in the last decade and a half. Overall, since the year 2000, we have 140,000 deaths attributed to heat waves that would not otherwise have occurred except for global warming. And by mid-century, extremely high temperatures observed once every two decades are now expected to occur every two to four years. Monthly global re uh, heat records have been broken 34 times since the year 2000. This is global monthly heat records. The last cold record was set in 1916, and the coldest year to date was in 1911. In a climate that is not changing, you'd expect a one-to-one -one ratio between hot record setting and cold record setting, months, years, days, what have you. There should be uh, symmetry, but it's greatly skewed towards the hot end. Record hot days now outnumber record cold days by a factor of 12 to 1. In Hawaii, last year was a little bit more than one degree Fahrenheit above normal, so we had a very hot year last year. We had 25 record-setting warm days and four record-setting cold days. And high heat is stressing our electrical grid. HECO, the uh, electricity utility, in 2014 and again in 2015, in August and in September, asked everybody, they declared uh, emergency advertisements that came out in every form of media, please do not run your air conditioning at night. We can't provide you with all the electricity you're demanding. So they warned us all that we were on the verge of a blackout here uh, island-wide on Oahu. No one has connected this to global warming, though. No one has connected this to climate change. So uh, that step still needs to be taken. <laughs> Heat waves are not yet on the radar screen of our decision makers and our elected officials. When you warm the air, evaporation increases, evapotranspiration increases, soil dries out, and the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere increases. This changes precipitation patterns. And in sort of a stroke of irony, it causes simultaneously expanding drought and expanding rain intensity. So you get more intense rains, but you get longer periods of drought, and droughts become deeper and drier. They begin earlier in the winter, they last later into the fall, and when it does rain, uh, the rain comes down extremely rapidly, and our water collection system, our drainage system, is not geared towards intense precipitation. It's geared to sort of uh, long soakings. Our drainage, the, the pipes that drain water out of urban areas have a certain diameter which is geared towards a certain type of uh, rainfall. But with very intense rainfall, we overwhelm our drainage system and we end up with knee deep water that shuts down uh, any sort of economic activity. This happened this past September and again in October in Honolulu. Um, the Evile district, where Best Buy and Costco are located, they were in uh, knee-deep water. They shut down for 24 hours. That's millions of dollars of commerce that came to a halt because of that. And that's just that in that one area. King Street, a main thoroughfare uh, in Honolulu, was closed in several locations for uh, half a day. So these intense precipitation events also don't soak the ground, and they don't provide recharge to our aquifers. They run right off into the ocean because our drainage, our, uh, our watershed system largely has been um, channelized. We no longer have natural meandering streams with typical rugosity and shade and everything. Our streams have been destroyed because we put in channelized conduits and that's how runoff is drained off of our steep neighborhoods uh, up in the, in the watersheds. And again, it runs right off into the ocean. So we're not trapping this very valuable drinking water that's falling out of the sky despite that drought is expanding and rainfall is decreasing in Hawaii. So we need to re-gear and rethink our water management um, engineering and policies here in Hawaii. So globally, this is also happening. Drought has increased and extreme rainfall has increased. Locally, we are starting to see this increase in rain intensity. And we're also seeing Weather-related disasters now <coughs> dramatically increase around the world. There's almost one every single day someplace on the planet. It's up 14% from the last decade, and we have twice as many weather-related disasters now as we did two decades ago. 
So here's the data on weather-related disasters. From 1980 up to present day, um, this shows geophysical disasters in red, which are things like earthquakes. Those and tsunamis, those are not showing a long-term increase. But in green, we have meteorological events. In blue, we have hydrological events. And in orange, we have climatological events. And around the world, here's the map for last year, we have heat waves and winter storms and tornadoes and typhoons and winter storms and more heat waves and severe storms and drought and wildfires, severe storms, severe storm, winter storm. So these are these, this increase in climate weather related disasters happening around the world. So this drives up your insurance costs, right? We all pay some premium. Uh, we all pay a premium for your car insurance, which I know many of you have, and housing insurance. Uh, when you start to buy houses. That, that raises the cost <coughs> for everybody around the world. So climate change is making life more expensive just in the form of uh, the need to pay more for insurance. And you can't buy a car, you can't buy a house unless a bank uh, uh, has proof that you've got insurance on that vehicle or on that dwelling. So insurance is a fact of life that we all have to deal with and it's getting more expensive because of this. All right, are you getting bummed out yet? Because I have more. <laughs> food, really bad news on food. Wheat currently provides 20% of all human protein. Rising CO2 decreases the nutrients content of wheat. In a world with mo more CO2 in the air, the stalk is, is thicker, the leaf is thicker, but the part we eat, the seed, is smaller. The same is true with corn. Corn cobs uh, are, are about half the size they normally are uh, in 450 parts per million, which is where we're going to be with CO2 content uh, by mid-century or a little bit after that. Corn stalks almost are like trees, and uh, the leaves are thick and papery, but the cob is smaller. So yes, CO2 is plant food, but the plants put it into growing um, the rest of the plant and not into the fruit or the seed. Because of this, uh, well, and by 2050, because of population growth, our demand for wheat is going to increase 60% because we'll be up to 9 billion people on this planet, but the actual yield is going to decline by 15%. This indicates we're in for food shortages, and Hawaii is at the tail end of the food distribution system. Right? We, you know, we bring, our food is brought in by, uh, uh, and containers. And we have to buy from the mainland the food that they're willing to sell us because they've already taken care of themselves first. Food prices are projected to double in the next 15 years, to double, and that's a global average. For folks like us in, in remote locations, we're gonna see more than a doubling. And we're going to see certain types of foods not become available because they'll be kept at the source. They'll be kept at places that grow those types of foods and need them. Obviously, this points very strongly at our need to grow our own food. It's more, growing our food is now gonna be more than just a hobby. We need to grow our own food so that Hawaii can literally feed itself over the next 15 years. Or again, once again, the cost associated with climate change are going to be unaffordable for us. So local food production is critical, and food requires irrigation. Irrigation is dependent on rain. And rain is a very interesting story. 2015, we had nine months of below average rainfall. August and September and November, we had 11 days of record-setting flooding, record-setting rainfall, but currently we're back into a drought. Now, on the back half of an El Nino, which is where we are now, you always can expect droughts in Hawaii and in uh, the front half of an El Nino, in fact, throughout most of an El Nino, you can expect drought through uh, most of the Western Pacific, Micronesia, et cetera. But we are seeing a long-term decline in rainfall in Hawaii. Uh, this decline has been shown for the last century, and it's accelerated over the last 30 years. Models suggest that in the future, wetter places in Hawaii will get wetter, and drier places in Hawaii will get drier. 
So we may still see enough rain falling in Hawaii, but it's not likely to be in the places where, we can current, where we're currently set up to catch it and where we currently live. The tips of the Ko'olau's, uh, high on the slopes of Haleakala, Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, these high regions, um, Mount Waialiali, um, Kauai, these very high wet regions are uh, currently modeled to continue to be wet and to continue to get uh, heavy rainfall. But where we grow our food is currently modeled to be um, experiencing greater drought. And so we've got to figure out how to get water from where it's falling to where we need it for irrigation to grow our food. So again, this, this uh, calls on a change in the engineering and the distribution of water in Hawaii. We likely will have enough water. The question is, can we get it from where it's falling to where we need uh, to put it? And part of that story will be catching the rain that falls every day all around us rather than letting it run off into the ocean. All over the mainland and around the world, they have what are known as storm sewer taxation districts. That's money that people pay in order to set up reservoirs, um, artificial wetlands, um, areas where rainwater can soak in, rather than letting the water just run off in the drainage system to actually trap rain, uh, rainwater because that's very good drinking water. So we need to do more about trapping rainwater uh, here in Hawaii. So these are the model results. De decreased winter rain in dry areas, uh, more of a drought to longer, drier summer, and greater demand on irrigation. All right, so obviously all of this has huge ecosystem implications. Uh, a great piece of work done by Camilo Mora in the geography department uh, last year defined what's known as a climate envelope. If you look at the last couple of centuries of climate, you have hot years and you have cold years, right? Well, the climate envelope is no longer flat. It's going like this. So in the future, our future cold years are going to be hotter than our past hot years. In other words, we're totally leaving the historical evolutionary climate envelope that we've had. And so in Hawaii, where we have very steep topography, we have lots of little microclimates and micro ecosystems related to those. They are all leaving their envelope into which they've evolved. So this opens up great weaknesses in our ecosystems and allows for invasive species, which are those species that don't mind heat waves, they don't mind droughts, they don't mind intense rain. These are very robust, hardy plants and animals that can thrive while our background ecosystem is growing weaker and weaker because of the changing conditions of temperature, uh, rainfall, etc. So there are enormous ecosystem threats here in Hawaii, and these are inviting conditions for invasive species. And one reason why this is worrisome, other than the obvious, is that 30 to 50 percent of the fresh water that recharges our aquifers comes from fog drip. It comes from direct contact of clouds with our high montane rainforests. And as those get destroyed by invasive species, we're going to be losing natural recharge to where we get our fresh water, which is from our aquifer systems. Spread of tropical diseases, I won't go into that. Let's talk a little bit about reef bleaching and ocean acidification. I'm sure you've heard of these problems. A recent paper just came out that looked at uninhabited islands around the Pacific and found that the coastal zone was characterized by hard coral and reef building organisms, whereas inhabited islands are characterized by mac mic excuse me, macroalgae and fleshy algae. Part of this is due to the human impact of nutrient loading in the coastal zone, right? giving food to these invasive types of fleshy algae. Another part of this is due to the warming of the water and the acidification of the water related to climate change that uh, is uh, detrimental to the calcifiers, the corals and the other organisms in the reef that uh, secrete calcium carbonate. Another negative impact is overfishing, which is, uh, you know, uh, the herbivores on the reef will crop back and help control these algae, but when we fish them out of there, um, the competition between algae and coral always leans towards algae. Coral can't really compete um, uh, with regard to fleshy algae. So 
the message here is that some of our current practices are impacting ecosystems that then sort of climate change piles on the problem. And one thing we can do is to back off our negative practices. If we can, if we can back off the negative stresses that we put not only on reefs but other types of ecosystems, perhaps they can respond and naturally adapt, or some community members can naturally adapt to climate change. This classic study um, describes how uh, a healthy reef under 375 parts per million CO2 and about one degree C of warming. We're currently at 403 parts per million and we've just reached one degree C of warming. Uh, changes, the ecosystem shifts at higher degrees of uh, temperature and higher amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. We see bleaching, uh, we see algal growth, and finally, at sort of end of the century uh, levels of climate change, uh, we really don't see any semblance of a coral reef at all. And we're in our third ever, glo ever global bleaching event, which was extended to 2016. It was announced by NOAA in 2015. The previous global events were in 2010 and 1998. Um, this one has been extended because of the strong El Nino. We don't often see bleaching in Hawaii, but we've seen dramatic bleaching here in Hawaii. It's really been quite noticeable. I'm sure you've heard a lot about reefs so far. And no doubt they've mentioned Hawaii is sort of in the outer colder waters of the tropic. The tropics, we don't have a whole lot of coral species here. We're somewhat robust when it comes to bleaching, but uh, that appears to be breaking down. Changing storminess. Models show, here's Hawaii. Models show that the storm tracks of tropical cyclones which historically have passed to the south of Hawaii are shifting towards the poles. And so now storm tracks have Hawaii in their crosshairs. Also in warmer air, hurricanes and tropical cyclones uh, grow more intense. And the rain that they bring is heavier. There's more rain, the winds are stronger. You don't necessarily see more hurricanes on the planet. In fact, we expect to see fewer hurricanes on Earth with global warming. But if they're changing their pathways, some locations can see more uh, tropical cyclones. And that, unfortunately, is Hawaii's situation. Cyclone paths are sh shifting to the north. They're becoming more intense. And we see more tropical cyclones here in Hawaii during El Nino years. Models are predicting more El Ninos in the future and more intense El Ninos in the future. This, this El Nino year, we saw 15 tropical cyclones in Hawaii waters, North Central Pacific waters. The average is four to five, and the past record was 11. So we can expect to see more strong El Ninos and with them more intense hurricanes that are now on a path headed towards Hawaii rather than south of Hawaii. All right, right about now, people either start shooting themselves, or they walk out of the room, or the climate deniers start throwing tomatoes at them. <laughs> so I've learned to put in a little optimistic slide here. Here's some cautious optimism about climate change. And in fact, I'll tell you, I've been forced in the last couple of weeks to consider, is the business as usual scenario the right scenario to use for modeling the future? Right, the worst case business as usual greenhouse gas emissions scenario. And I'm, I've decided no, business as usual is probably not, we're not headed down that road anymore, largely because of China. I think we're down one step to, if you know what RCP 4.5 is, that's sort of the next climate scenario down where we still are emitting greenhouse gases, but we have reduced the amount of greenhouse gases. Last year, a record $286 billion was invested around the world in renewable energy, twice as much as was invested in coal and gas-fired power plants. The use of coal has dropped 17% in the US, from 50% down to 33%. Global cost of solar power has fallen 75% in the last five years. So solar power is becoming more affordable. We actually need it to become cheap before it can really take off, but at least it's becoming more affordable. 84% of Americans support clean energy. California requires 
all homes to reach net zero carbon by 2020. And that's just four years from now. And all businesses 10 years after that. China, the world's largest greenhouse gas emitter, the 800 pound gorilla in the room, may have already reached its peak emissions. It may already start to be flattening its greenhouse gas emissions. It's investing $16 billion in electric car infrastructure. That basically means charging stations are going to be put in all around China. It's phasing out coal use, primarily because they finally decided eight-year-olds in Beijing getting lung cancer was a bad thing. <laughs> and they have these mega cities with horrible air quality, and they're finally doing something about it. And so car exhaust, burning of coal and petroleum, those are on the way out in China. And the great thing about a dictatorship is you can get things done right away. So they've decided that they're going to move in this direction, and they're moving in that direction. In 2015, they invested $110 billion, twice as much as we did in renewable energy. India is moving 400 million people under solar panels. Sweden now recycles 99% of household waste. That's amazing. Sweden, a nation with no waste. That's amazing. The place where coal was invented is going to wean itself off of coal power by 2025. Coal miners and coal, that came from England. And uh, they're going to be one of the first people's, people to uh, get away from it. Divestment campaigns globally have led to uh, $2.5 trillion di divested out of fossil fuel companies. And we can be proud the University of Hawaii Board of Regents voted to divest from any investment in fossil fuel companies. And in December of last year, 195 nations agreed to a framework for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So a lot of good news, and every week there's, there's more good news. You can see I've crammed as many things on this slide as I can, and I keep updating and putting more on there. And that's one reason why I think we're going to avoid the business as usual or worst case scenario. However, in December, at Paris, the world agreed, let's stop warming at 2 degrees C, and if possible, below 2 degrees C. We still have a long way to go. The current promises of all the nations would stop us at 3 degrees C. We had largest CO2 growth ever last year. And most technical experts dispute that 1.5 degrees C is even attainable unless we learn how to physically withdraw CO2 from the atmosphere. And there's been a lot of work on CO2 removal from the atmosphere for decades. And it hasn't yet scaled up. <coughs> You produce more CO2 scaling up your CO2 <laughs> removal system. So we haven't figured out how to actually remove CO2 from the atmosphere yet. Even a 90% cut in current, mission, current emissions in the next 10 years is insufficient to limit warming to 2 degrees C. What do you think the uh, current global use of renewables for energy is. What percent of electricity globally comes from renewable energy? Someone give me a number. 15? 10%? 10 percent? Five. Five? Right here, one. One percent. In the U.S., we're up to 10 percent. U.S. has been growing. But globally, it's not happening yet. Yep. What about China? How much percent are they using? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> Emissions through 2015 already have locked in over a meter of sea level rise. So those of you who know any geology know that we just had an ice age 20,000 years ago. And before that, there was a warm period, similar to the warm period we live in today. That warm period, sea levels were about six meters higher than present and temperature was about two degrees C warmer than present. And so when everything comes into balance, the warming of the ocean, the melting of the ice, the warming of the atmosphere, when everything comes into balance and no more greenhouse gases are being emitted, at two degrees C, most of the world's major cities are underwater. It will take a few centuries, we hope, and not sooner, but uh, we're still in a very bad way, even with two degrees C of warming. Okay, sea level rise. 
Any quick questions before I continue burning through all this information? <laughs> no pun intended. All righty. You know, NASA has five launch pads, and they're all on coastlines because they want their rockets who fail to fall in the ocean, not to fall on a city. And so they're very concerned about sea level rise and coastal erosion, and they monitor it. They put satellites up there that monitor sea level rise, as I'll show you in a minute. And they say, given that what we know now about how the ocean expands as it warms and how ice sheets melt and add water to the seas, it's pretty certain we're locked into at least three feet of sea level rise by the end of the century and more. Rising sea level causes coastal erosion, wave flooding, groundwater inundation, drainage failure, hurricane and tsunami vulnerability increases because a tsunami that may not have done much damage with a one foot higher sea level may do a lot more damage. So we're going to touch on, on all of these. Here's Greenland. Greenland is melting from the coastline where it's very steep up to the plateau where it's very flat. And the rate of melting is rising, uh, that net melt line is rising 40 meters in elevation every year. So that as it gets up onto the flat plateau, it's going to be you know, racing across the flat plateau. So that by 2025, the entire surface of the Greenland ice sheet is expected to be red here. Now let me clarify some things about this. Greenland, or any glacier, is like your checking account, right? If you don't make deposits, you eventually have to stop making withdrawals, right? And deposits have to be bigger than withdrawals for your account to grow. Well, currently withdrawals, or melting, are much larger than deposits or snowfall. We still have snowfall up in these blue areas, but we have a lot more red. So overall, the ice account for Greenland is in strong deficit. And every year, it, it, uh, it increases, the amount of deficit increases. Antarctica is the other major uh, amount of ice on the planet. We have East Antarctica here, where there's still a lot of debate. Is it melting? Is it growing? Uh, there are half a dozen papers that conclude that this area is melting. There's one paper that came out recently that says, no, nope, it's not melting, it's actually growing. So we still have research to do there. West Antarctica, everybody's in agreement, is in a state of net retreat. In fact, there's a series of glaciers right over here, especially the large Pine Island and Thwaites, Thwaites glaciers, that are in a state of irreversible retreat. So there's so much ice that it actually pushes the continent down. And if this is the edge of your glacier floating on the ocean, the land underneath slopes down. And as the ice retreats, warm seawater gets underneath. It's not as if the ice is retreating out of the ocean up into the mountains. It's retreating into deeper and deeper water. And it's now in a state of irreversible retreat. The Western Antarctica ice sheet appears to have collapsed. The area shown here in red, scientists say further degradation is almost certainly unstoppable. They say global warming is accelerating the pace of disintegration. NASA's lead polar ice researcher said, quote, this is really happening. There's nothing to stop it now. These scientists say the ice sheet can add 13 feet to global sea levels slowly at first and over the next 100 years or so. So it's actually over the next several centuries. He was wrong in that last little bit. But this came out in 2014. Raise your hand if you've heard of this before. No kidding. You guys know the West Antarctic ice sheet is in a state of irreversible collapse? Yes, raise your hand. I heard something about their like it's melting awesome. and collapsing. Like Where do these people ago. come from? They're actually <laughs> on it. <laughs> Usually I get zero hands that go up. Congrats, all of you. All right, I won't give you my lecture about where you get your information. <laughs> Topex Poseidon satellite. Uh, this one's up there from NASA. Uh, it's mapping the world's oceans every 10 days. And the data from Topex Poseidon is up here. Here we go back to 1900, so we have the 20th century and then up to present day. Uh, prior to the satellite data, we used tide gauges around the world to understand uh, how sea level was changing. 
And the tide gauges tell us that in the early part of the 20th century, we had about half a millimeter per year of sea level rise globally. By uh, most of the 20th century, that had doubled. Into the satellite era, this had doubled again. So we have a doubling time here of several decades. And recently, we're up to four and a half millimeters per year. It's, uh, this is a very short term period though. So the statistics here are not robust yet. It didn't manage to get a, a paper published by Yee et al. Um, Jim Hansen, who was a former NASA climate scientist, says that the doubling time of global sea level rise is a sure sign that some very massive that some very nasty things are uh, in our future. So uh, if you get a chance to find them, uh, Hansen's paper, which just got published, he talks about superstorms. He talks about uh, rapid retreat of the Antarctic ice sheet and uh, sufficient sea level rise that we're looking at meters of sea level rise by mid-century. Um, that's sort of the worst case scenario that's out there, but it's by a very legitimate scientist. And he has 13 co-authors, all of whom are all very legitimate scientists. So there's a very worrisome scenario out there. So here's the uh, high waves we had this past winter up on the North Shore. Here's uh, Waimea Bay Beach. You don't see this very often, right? This is standing in the parking lot and the waves are coming up over the grassy area. These high waves are giving us a window of what we can expect with higher sea levels. Uh, they take down seawalls, they undermine houses, uh, they cause a lot of flooding. Um, simple things that we can all do is build houses up on footers like this so that when a wave comes by, it doesn't destroy the first floor of your house. Instead, it's really more of a minor annoyance rather than a catastrophic situation. So simple building code changes are an easy first step that the city and county of Honolulu can do. And in fact, everybody in the world can do is raise your house up. When you build a new house, don't build it on the ground level. Another aspect of sea level rise is that it comes up our storm drains. This is actually salt water that's flowing towards us. This is not rainwater that's draining off the road. You can see the road is perfectly dry. This is salt water flooding into our uh, area in Waikiki, and this is what the beginning of sea level rise looks like. In Miami, they're a couple decades ahead of us. They see this at the highest tides of the year knee-deep salt water just sort of passively coming out of the drainage system. I have friends that have magical lakes in their backyard, magical ponds. At high tide, there's a lake. At low tide, there's no lake. It's the groundwater table rising and falling with the tides because the water under the ground in the coastal area um, is driven by the tides. It gets pumped by the tides. So uh, that's what the first sort of phase of sea level rise looks like in a city. And we, we have elements of this already. When it rains intensely, um, the drainage is a problem, especially at high tide. Coastal erosion. Today, 70% of our beaches are eroding. We expect this to increase to 90 and then 100% as we move through the century. And erosion could uh, destroy as much as 200 feet of land by the end of the century. Currently, we allow houses to be built so that they're protected 40 feet back from the coast. But if 200 feet of erosion is going to occur, it means basically our, all of our development in the coastal zone is uh, vulnerable. So we do some modeling of this in my research group. And we use the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change scenarios, the worst case scenario, uh, which is RCP 8.5. and. Um, this assumes about a half foot of, of sea level rise by 2030, about a foot of sea level rise by mid-century, two feet, and then three feet by the end of the century. And here's what uh, Honolulu looks like, both as a function of groundwater inundation, as well as um, water coming over the coastline. Let's look more carefully, though. Here is Eva, and this is groundwater inundation. In other words, this is a new wetland that will form as sea level rises. Those green pixels are not connected to the ocean. It's, it's a wetland that's forming. The blue pixels are connected to the ocean. So you get ocean, uh, passive ocean flooding. 
And erosion, here's what the erosion boundary looks like by the end of the century. And then we have other boundaries modeled here. But more important is the waves. So if you take a typical south swell in the summertime, right, uh, it'll be a couple of meters high face height. Let's take that wave and let's run it up on the beach using, using uh, a model, and you get this sort of thing today. The wave doesn't really do any flooding of the homes, but by 2030, we start to see a little flooding. By 2050, now by 2075, and then by the end of the century. So basically, Eva Beach is doomed. You cannot live in a place that gets flooded this frequently. That's three feet of sea level rise. If we're wrong, and it's a little bit more than that, it looks like this, that's four feet of sea level rise. So let's see if this movie starts on its own. Okay, so here is wave inundation up on the North Shore, there's the coastal road, and this is the year 2100. The red line is erosion, under three feet of sea level rise. The blue is wave flooding, there's Waimea Bay, all of Waimea gets flooded by the typical seasonal high waves. So for the North Shore, we're using a wave that's on the order of 20 foot face height. Nothing truly huge, but I mean, it's big, but you get that every year. Big parts of the coastal road and big parts of these communities are basically flooded by waves year after year, and a lot of the land is eroded away. As we turn the corner and come down past Cabela Bay and Turtle Bay, you start to see groundwater inundation. The land is lower down here by only about a foot or so, but if that's low enough that it starts to experience new wetlands developing. And we're in the shrimp farm area here, so it's already very, we already know that's a very low lying area. So groundwater inundation, coastal erosion, wave inundation, all of these things make life very hard. You need to adapt to these things. And so we have to redesign the architecture and the economics and the transportation and the electricity grid, the sewage grid, you know, you can no longer have a cesspool, which is most of the buildings you're looking at are on cesspools, which is a, a tank in your backyard. When you flush the toilet, it, it goes to that tank and it cleans itself by the water is cleansed by going through the soil. Well, when the, wa when the water table is high, that cesspool is no longer effective. So all along here, we have all the coastal houses and the first block, or even, even Malka, a couple of blocks of communities, basically underwater, either through groundwater inundation or through wave flooding, or through loss of the land, through coastal erosion. So we need to reimagine our communities. And you know, looking on the bright side, what a great opportunity to build communities that are sustainable and beautiful and, um, you know, truly uh, communities that we can envision for the future. Something that looks like this. Buildings that are raised above the ground, uh, that are designed to be flooded, tsunamis, hurricane storm surge, they can flow underneath here, roads that are designed to be flooded. Uh, we sculpt the land so that we have sort of berms and, and swales. Uh, we have small businesses. This is called smart, smart growth. You have small businesses and you have people living in communities so that you, know, you can walk to get your shopping, you can walk to where you work, a little less reliance on cars, or if you need cars, you know, it'd be electronic vehicle, electric cars, uh, electric public transportation, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to really change how our communities look and we keep sort of uh, poking at the problem but not getting really serious with it. So I hope I've convinced you that climate change is a very serious issue. There's a lot ahead of us if we're going to adapt to it properly and still have healthy, healthy communities. So please start challenging the people you vote for and asking them, you know, the politicians, what are their thoughts on climate change and what are they going to do to ensure the future? All right, thank you very much.